challenges for reparations, hosted by the Hugh Shero Labor Studies Institute here at the University of the West Indies Open Campus, and the National Council on Reparations, chaired by Mrs. Lalita Davis Mattis. This morning, we will be officially welcomed by the Pro Vice Chancellor for Global Affairs at the University of the West Indies and the principal of the UWI Open Campus, Dr. Luz Longsworth. After our official welcome, the UWI's Vice Chancellor and Chairman of the CARICOM Reparations Commission, a distinguished economic historian and thought leader, Professor Sir Hilary Beckles, will provide the context and overview for our discussion. Sir Hilary is also Vice President of the International Task Force for the UNESCO Slave Root Project. A distinguished panel of academic leaders and social activists will follow. Professor Anthony Bogues, as a Mesa Professor of Humanities and Critical Theory, Director of the Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice, and Professor of Africana Studies at Brown University in the United States, will be the lead, will begin the uh, presentation. Then we will have Dr. Shani Roper, curator at the University of the West Indies Museum, and a former director of Liberty Hall, which of course was the center of activities for the UNIA and the spiritual tabernacle for the Garvey movement. Then we'll hear from Dr. Michael Barnett, who is a senior lecturer in critical race theory and African diaspora studies at the Department of Sociology, Psychology and Social Work at the Muna campus of the University of the West Indies. And then Professor Rupert Lewis, internationally renowned Garvey scholar, Professor Emeritus of Political Thought at the UWI Muna and Director of the UWI PJ Patterson Center for African Caribbean Advocacy. Each of the panelists is expected to speak for no more than 15 minutes. And at the end of the four presentations, we'll invite you, the participants, to join the discussion. Persons are expected to submit questions or comments via chat. And those questions or comments will be posed to the respective speaker. We are live streaming on the Open Campus Facebook page and YouTube channel. And so the theme of the webinar underscores the conviction of the pro vice chancellor and principal of the Open Campus. It's a conviction that has propelled her into the realm of Pracademia, creating practical advantage from academic work and insights. It is not so much what the university can do for the individual as what it can do for the country in terms of development, she's quoted as saying. Education for her is rooted in a philosophy which must be seen as a tool to take us out of poverty, to overcome mediocrity, and to lead us on a path of development of ourselves and others. Dr. Longsworth, the Pro Vice Chancellor of Global Affairs and Principal of the University of the West Indies Open Campus, will now officially welcome all of us. Dr. Longsworth. Thank you very much, Chair. And I want to start by extending a special welcome to our keynote speaker, our Vice Chancellor, uh, a tireless advocate in the area of reparatory justice, as well as our very distinguished panel. And to extend a special welcome to all on behalf of the UE Open Campus, 
in my capacity as principal of the Open Campus, which is hosting this webinar through the Hugh Sharer Labor Institute, but also taking on my second hat of Pro Vice Chancellor overseeing the global affairs to welcome those persons who are joining us from across the diaspora and in fact, across the entire world. I, I was quite um, heartened by the number of persons who contacted us um, asking for access to the webinar. Uh, it was amazing and overwhelmingly so. And it just shows the amount of interest that is being um, generated in this particular topic, not just in the region, but in the entire world. So I wish to acknowledge the extraordinary efforts of both the Hugh Sherrill Labor Studies Institute here at the UE Open Campus and the National Council on Reparations in hosting this very important and seminal webinar on a topic that is not just profoundly important, but is deeply relevant, particularly now as education faces even greater challenges in the COVID era. In recent times, we have seen a shift in attitude from institutions across the former colonial world, including universities, um, even the Bank of England, by way of their apologies for historical links to slavery and the slave trade. Our keynote speaker, Sir Hillary, reminds us that apologies are precursors to reparation and that ultimately what we seek is reparatory justice because reparatory justice is not about handouts, it is about development. The institution of slavery deprived us of knowledge of who we were. And miseducation was one means by which enslaved Africans were kept in bondage and subject to control. It was Carter Woodson, an American historian who reminded us that through education, the oppressors were able to control the minds of enslaved persons. And therefore, there was no need to worry about the actions of slavery. Although we have come a far way since then, miseducation still lingers in the psyche of too many of our people. And therefore, a concerted effort must be made to, to use Garvey's own words and beautifully expressed in music by Bob Marley, to emancipate ourselves from mental slavery as none but ourselves can free our minds. The concept of this webinar cannot therefore be narrowly defined. It simply cannot speak only to the formal education system bequeathed to us by the colonial rulers. For their system of education, physically, psychologically, and socially, forced us to accept hardship, abuse, and exploitation as a way of life and ignore the absence of dignity and respect for ourselves. So in welcoming you, I want to urge you to understand the significance of rediscovering ourselves and our greatness as a people and as a race, and how the value of education in liberating our minds will advance the process towards reparatory justice. To paraphrase Garvey, we must as a region prepare ourselves educationally, industrially, and politically to chart our own destiny. There is much for us to be proud of as Caribbean peoples. And here I have to bring in our University of the West Indies and what we have achieved as a university in only 72 years. We have reached to the top of the International Times Higher Education Rankings. And that in itself is a testament of the work that we have been doing in our region to liberate and emancipate our minds. But we are not fully there yet. This webinar must move us a little further along the path of our own progress. We must be fully prepared to make development happen and to recognize the important role that education plays in ensuring that this does happen. 
It is in this spirit that I welcome everyone to this webinar this morning. I hope that you will listen carefully, learn, and make one change, especially if you are an educator, to how you do things, to how you teach, to how you engage your students and their minds as a result of something that you will have learned from this webinar. I will close by once again quoting Marcus Garvey. He reminded us, out of our own created genius, we make ourselves what we want to be. Let the sky and God be our limit and eternity our measurement. But ladies and gentlemen, we cannot wait on eternity to make immeasurable changes to decolonizing our education system. I hope that this webinar will be one more important leap in that direction. I look forward to hearing from all of our distinguished speakers and to engaging in the conversations that follow. Once again, welcome and thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Pro Vice Chancellor and Principal. Um, after uh, such a welcome done with clearness and lucidity that certainly should have lifted our spirits and put us in good stead for the Vice Chancellor's presentation. Sir Hillary, I want to begin by extending congratulations to you for being named by the Rotary Foundation as the Paul Harris Fellow in recognition of the extensive work as a thought leader you have done in the field of social justice and minority empowerment. You certainly have joined a distinguished international grouping, which includes uh, former US President Jimmy Carter, former Russian President Boris Yeltsin, and former UN Secretary General Javier Perez de Coulio. As a Caribbean scholar like CLR James, you too have been fermented in an English scholastic cauldron, which you now intend to light a fire. Please go ahead, sir. Am I being heard clearly? Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Danny, for your kind and uh, generous introductory uh, comments. I appreciate uh, your kindness very much. I, and uh, I, I love your description of Luz Longworth. She is a light bringer. She does bring light. <laughs> and uh, we have benefited from her enlightenment for so many for so many years, and I, I am honored to be a part of this seminar. Uh, this this theme, the concept, uh, the, the the paradigm that we are developing, and Danny, thank you. Wonderful to be a part of this with Luz and Rupert and, and Michael and Shani, and of course, of course, our dear friend Tony uh, from afar. It is it is indeed heartening. The comments I will make will be to some extent regional, but I will make some specific comments in respect of Jamaica. Even though just this morning, the Prime Minister of Dominica has issued a statement calling for curriculum reform uh, in his country to accommodate these kinds of discourses that young people ought to have access, access to. Decolonizing an educational system is indeed what development and nation building is, is all about. Uh, you consider Jamaica uh, that had been a British colony for 307 years. Uh, Jamaica was at the height of slavery, the, the richest British colony in the world uh, that played a very important part 
and the transformation of Britain itself and its industrial culture, uh, Jamaica was a juggernaut in wealth creation from slavery. And to have a country like Jamaica with millions of Africans working freely in that process, uh, you cannot help but to recognize Jamaica's centrality in the making of the Western world and whatever the Western world had, had become in terms of economic development and transformation. We, we know that in our Jamaica, uh, at least 1.5 million Africans were imported here. Uh, imported here for one primary purpose, uh, which is to labor on behalf of the empire, labor to facilitate British transformation. And, and labor and death mortality were so closely integrated because at the end of uh, near 200 years of massive chattel slavery, that 1.5 million Africans who were imported at emancipation, there were only 300,000 left remaining. The question you have to ask, how do 1.5 million African people brought into a small island and after 200 years of that, there were only 300,000 remaining. So we, we cannot escape the fact that slavery in Jamaica was also genocidal, less than 20% survival rate. Uh, so we uh, here in Jamaica, we are the survivors of this Holocaust. And therefore we are speaking about Holocaust survivors, Holocaust mentality, and the expectation of a people who have experienced this genocidal uh, journey through, through time. So we are looking then uh, at a society, a survivor society that also have put in place one of the most formidable systems of resilience and resistance. The, 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 the narrative of resistance of the African people in Jamaica stands second to none anywhere in the modern world. It was indeed a civil war uh, on this island for freedom and, and for justice and, and for nation building. And I do agree with uh, Dr. Longsworth that the reparatory justice process is about development within nation building. It is the joint discourse of nation building with citizenship and development in terms of economic transformation, social justice. So for us in the CARICOM reparatory justice process, what we are speaking about is the development and transformation of our communities that have survived out of the Holocaust and have embraced the concept of the nation as the vehicle on which they will travel uh, through time. In that regard, we situate our moment. We situate our moment, the emancipation discourses of the 1830s still not complete. Everyone is fully aware that that process has not been complete because we know it was a legal process, a legal process that was meant to freeze and consolidate the notions of freedom and justice in other words, there was no intention of associating liberty and freedom for the black people with emancipation. There was no concept that the idea of the Emancipation Act was to consolidate a slave-like culture after slavery. It was to consolidate black op oppression and imprisonment within emancipation. It was not intended whatsoever to create a liberation culture for the black people. So therefore we know what emancipation was. And as a result of that, Jamaica went back to the battlefield in 1865 to help to reconcile this reality that if you want to have emancipation, you have to have freedom. The, the, the Paul Bogle revolution of 1865 was an attempt to go back to really to get the contradiction of the Emancipation Act. And this is not surprising because in that, same, in that same moment of history, the American nation did exactly the same thing. 
they, they built a nation out of their revolution. They kept slavery as the basis of the nation. They imagined that the American nation could have risen up and developed on the basis of slavery. And they had to go back to the battlefield uh, at the same time that Bogle did in a very bloody civil war to show that freedom and slave-like conditions, that freedom and slavery, that nationhood and slavery cannot coexist in the same place for a common purpose. So they went back to relitigate. Paul Bogle went back to relitigate. And we have to understand this is where we have reached now in terms of Jamaica having received its nationhood 58 years and is now looking to the future. So this conversation is all tied up with what you call here decolonizing the educational system. Let me begin then with one specific empirical fact of the moment. Jamaica is about to go into independence. The premier of Jamaica organizes a visit to London to discuss a settlement package, a reparations package for Jamaica. The Premier Sir Alexander has in his hand on that visit to London, the first week of July, 1962, he has in his hand Jamaica's 10-year development plan. It's going to independence, it has a 10-year development plan. And he goes to Britain to say, you have been extracting wealth from this country for 307 years, and now you owe us millions. And he introduced a concept of Britain owing Jamaica millions. And he's in London to negotiate a part partial access to some of that millions that have been extracted out of Jamaica. He wants a piece of this because he wants to fund Jamaica's first 10 year development plan into independence. They listened to him. The British government listened to him. Secretary for Colonies, Reginald Maudlin and his team listened very carefully. And in the end, they said to him, I made it very clear that his requests were preposterous. That was the word they used to describe his requests for development support for the first 10 year plan, preposterous. And went on to say to his delegation that Britain owes Jamaica nothing. And that the best we can do is to give you something so that you can go away. The language of that conversation, we now have the records of it. So I'm speaking from the archive of those discussions, which we have been able to secure as a result of the public access to those official secret documents. So Jamaica is told that its demand is preposterous. Jamaica is told that Britain owes it nothing. In the midst of that conversation, uh, Mr. Siaga, then the young Siaga, who was a part of the, the Bustamante team, became very irritated and intervened in the conversation and explained to the British delegation that Jamaica is in a mess because of British colonization. We are in a mess because of British colonization and Britain has a duty to pay some form of repertory alleviation to help this nation on its way to development and nationhood. But from the point of view of this conversation, the critical statement which he made in his plea for support, repertory support, was that Jamaica has school places for only 7% of the children. He spoke about water and housing and all the other areas where Jamaica was in a mess left by British colonization. But I wish to focus on his concept that Jamaica had school places for only 7% of the children. And that going forward, they need to build schools, they need to build colleges and all of that. Britain gave no support. So off Jamaica went, in its nationhood, its idealism, driven by its history, driven by its resistance, standing on its own feet and going forward alone. But going forward alone did not mean that the case that was made was not legitimate. 
the choice of going forward alone was precisely because Britain had made it clear that nothing was owed to Jamaica and that certainly any attempt to extract revenue from the British Treasury would be resisted. This was not only applied to Bustamante in Jamaica. Eric Williams in Trinidad walked in the same footprint that Sir Alexander had walked. Eric Williams went to Trinidad, went to London to have the same conversation. He had in his hand his five-year industrial development plan. And he asked Britain for a golden handshake. The golden handshake was what is normally given when an imperial nation and a colony agree to part ways, a nation is going to emerge. You shake hands and you put something in the pound. And that is the issue. The shaking of the hand and the imperial nation putting something in the pound to allow the young nation to go forward. Malta received 50 million pounds as the golden handshake. The British government, the other European governments organized what was called the Colombo plan. The Colombo plan, the Colombo plan was for the, the East Indian colonies. The East Indian colonies are going into independence. The Western nations got together and created the Colombo plan. They met in Colombo, Sri Lanka, and they organized the Colombo plan to help the East Indian colonies to rise into nationhood. And they were very clear that this is the future. When the East Indian colonies rise to become nations, they will become economic uh, powerhouses and the Western world will benefit from the transformation of the East Indies from colonies to nations. The West Indies called for a similar plan. They called for a plan to create the foundation for the transformation of the West Indies. So the East Indies got the Colombo plan, the West Indies got nothing. We were told to go away. The question is what, what exactly is responsible for giving the East Indies the Colombo plan and the West Indies plan was rejected. Now, when we speak of decolonization, therefore, of the educational system, we are speaking about a system that has many elements within it. Historically, such a system is in transition to nationhood. You have a colonial education system that was designed to sustain colonization. Remember that in the 1930s, 100 years after emancipation, Britain was preparing to rule this region for another 100 years. They were digging in for another 100 years. The workers of the Caribbean thought otherwise. They rose up against colonization. The workers' movement drove a decolonization movement at the time when the colonizer was preparing for another hundred years of rule. So remember that the West Indians were the ones who rose up against the British Empire, defeated the British Empire in the Caribbean, island by island, colony by colony. And I say defeat because once the workers of the region, once the region had risen up, there was no going back. After 38, there was no going back. You could not put the genie back into the bottle. From 38 onwards, it was just a matter of negotiating the exit, negotiating what it will look like. Would it be federation? Yes, let's negotiate federation onto independence. That is what happened after 38. The Caribbean said, empire is over. We are exiting and the strategy is first independent uh, federation, then the second strategy, an independent federation and nationhood for the region. So remember the anger towards the Caribbean because once the Caribbean had risen up to put an end to the British Empire, Africa and Asia followed in our footsteps. The African nations, colonies and the Asian colonies then realized that the first British colonies, the Caribbean, the first British colonies 
had put an end to the empire and was negotiating the exit. Africa and Asia said, okay, the West Indies have started the ball rolling. Now we started the ball rolling because we rose up. We weren't just talking about it. We rose up on the streets for justice and the end. Africa and Asia followed in that tradition. And by the 1960s, when the independence now is being negotiated, there is tremendous anger against the West Indies and the British government. We, we have those documents, uh, Reginald Maudlin, we were told, who was negotiating those conversations on behalf of the British government. Uh, Gordon Lewis wrote in his book, check Gordon Lewis's book, The Making of the Modern West Indies, in which he says that Maudlin showed the West Indian leaders an angry face, a face filled with anger that we had the audacity to rise up in the streets against the British Empire and triggering a global process triggering a global process, anger in London towards the West Indies. So we are entering our independence agenda, nation building. We are entering nation building and nationhood in an environment of anger and rage. When you read the comments made by the British High Commissioner in Kingston, so morally, when you read his correspondence back to London about Sir Alexander, about the people of Jamaica, when you read those letters, they will make your skin crawl because you cannot imagine that right here in Kingston, a high commissioner can be degrading the leadership of the country, degrading the people of the island. There's a gentleman called Mr. Thompson, who was a very good friend of the British High Commissioner. And he stayed as a guest of the British High Commissioner in Kingston. He had come out from England. He has come out from England to write a commentary about Jamaica. And at the end of his summary, he said, the people of Jamaica are as ready for democracy and independence as a three month old baby is ready to change its own diaper. That was right here in Kingston. That is a narrative as Jamaica is rising for nationhood. That is the environment. And so the educational system in transition, the capacity, I call this the seven, the seven C's when I speak of transition from colonization to nationhood. I speak of the seven C's, the educational system, the system, the capacity of the system for the people, the capacity of a nation to provide reasonable education for its new citizens, the capacity from then 50 years later on is the capacity appropriate. We can speak about that. The curriculum, is the curriculum of a young emerging nation on the second stage of its transition to nationhood. And we assume the first 50 years is phase one, Jamaica is now into phase two of nation building. Is the curriculum decolonized? The causes of an education, what are the causes? What is the reason? It is about raising consciousness among the citizens. It is about building a consciousness among those citizens for nation building. And it's about building a nation within the context of the foundations of your culture and your civilization. That is what you're building upon, your culture and your civilization. Thus the conversation about civics, uh, the children, and the schools and colleges, are they equipped with the grasp of the civics of this journey? And finally, nations are in a global competitive world. Is the nation competitive? And to be competitive, you have to be confident. When you take all of those C's and you say they constitute the education system, the system is not just a physical plant, it's all of the other issues. 
it's the it's the curriculum it's the consciousness it's the culture it's the civilization it's the confidence it's the competitiveness it is all of that interwoven into a matrix that drives a people upward and onward you cannot do it until you decolonize i can share with you at the very highest level in terms of the repertory justice movement when i was invited to participate as vice chancellor of this university five years ago. There was tremendous opposition to the appointment on the basis that I was the chairman of the CARICOM Reparations Commission. And I was told that to get the support I need in order to have a, an appointment made, that I would have to remove myself from the chairmanship of that commission because the University of the West Indies should not be embedded in that discourse. And I remember going to PJ Patterson to seek his wisdom. What should I do? Out of that conversation, I realized that the University of the West Indies was created precisely for reparations. That out of the 38 rebellion of our people, the British government that sent the Moyne Commission to find out why we were unhappy, why we were rebelling, said that our public health was the worst in the British Empire. The public health of the people, the black people, was the worst in the British Empire. And that the West Indies, to quote the words of former Prime Minister Lloyd George, that we were the slum of the British Empire. Those two concepts found their way into the recommendation that there should be a university of the West Indies and it should begin as a medical school to cure the public health crisis of the people of this region. So the university emerged as an institution of reparations to cure the public health crisis and in so doing, provide an education for the few. How then can a process of reparatory justice be isolated from the University of the West Indies? We are the primary vehicle created specifically to repair the harm done to our people. And I concluded, therefore, I had to say that no, on the contrary, the university must be at the center of this discourse for development, upliftment, nationhood, freedom, justice. This is what this university should be about. And we have proceeded on that assumption. And I should say by way of closing, the university has done some interesting things of late. We are listening to the conversation about whether all of our countries should become republics. That conversation is now taking place across the region in Jamaica, Barbados, and other places. University of the West Indies, we entered the conversation last year. We approached the Privy Council. We approached Her Majesty, who was the head of our university as the visitor, the ultimate appellant voice. And we approached and we made our case that the time has come for the University of the West Indies to have as its legal head a Caribbean jurist domesticate our institution, indigenize it. And Her Majesty was very understanding. Her Majesty agreed that the head of our university should be a West Indian jurist in terms of student staff appeals, the ultimate appellate court for justice. She agreed. And we had the most remarkable civil conversation between her office, the Privy Council, so as to decolonize that aspect of our constitution. And we thank her for her wisdom and her judgment so that UWI now has at its apex a Caribbean choice. These are conversations you can have. Then we recognize that on our campus in St. Augustine, we have Milner Hall that had been there 
for almost 90 years. And all of us visiting the campus knew that the oldest, longest, biggest hall was Milner Hall. And all of us had assumed somehow, I certainly did, that this Milner was some kind of colonial philanthropist until I was in South Africa at Johannesburg University giving a lecture and some Zulu students came to me and said, Vice Chancellor, why are you celebrating the founder of South African apartheid on your campus? And I said, what are you talking about? Lord Alfred Milner, the governor of the Transvaal, who committed genocidal atrocities against the Zulu people in his role as governor of the Transvaal, and who had declared himself in his own memoirs as a white supremacist, who had defined black people as inferior, animal-like, that somehow we had a dormitory on our campus with his name on it. Because on his death, he left resources to create a school for tropical agriculture in the British Empire. And the purpose of that school was to create white farmers, white men who came from England to study tropical agriculture. So that when the British army took away the land from the people in Africa and Asia and Australasia, that they could then bring these graduates over to manage the land and to create successful farms in the colonies so that the empire could be sustained. And this is how the School for Tropical Agriculture was created in Trinidad out of the legacy of Lord Alfred Milner. It was taken to Trinidad. He wanted it to go to Malaysia, but it was taken to Trinidad because the governor of Trinidad was his schoolmate at Oxford. We rolled that into UE. We rolled that into UE without realizing that we were importing the apartheid leader and architect into our environment. When we got that fact and we did our research and we validated the truth of this, we took his name down from our university campus and the students participated in the process and replaced his name with freedom. So that hall, that dormitory is now called Freedom Hall. But we didn't end there. We have created a center for reparations research to drive these conversations through the schools and colleges and civic society. And now we have established the PJ Patterson Center for Africa Caribbean Advocacy. We are doing our best with decolonizing our aspect of the system. We recognize that we have some work to do uh, from 1968 when the Walter Rodney moment was the first attempt, the moment of truth to decolonize the curriculum the decolonizing institution, the Rodney moment was the moment where we lost innocence, where we were getting ready to take UE into its second phase and Walter's experience driven out of the campus that had produced him, driven out of the country he loved, Jamaica, loved Jamaica, driven out of the country he wanted to be his home, Jamaica, driven out of the country and the campus where he wanted to be his intellectual base for his lifelong journey, driven out. The result we know, he went into a process that culminated in his assassination. We then miss his mind. We miss the presence of his intellect. And we are now in the post Rodney cleanup. But all of this now has to trickle down through the system because we know that in our beloved Jamaica, what is holding back Jamaica's development and is a tremendous anxiety in Jamaica for economic growth, economic transformation, social justice. This is the force of history coming into the present demanding material advancement out of poverty demanding social justice out of inequality, demanding black empowerment out of a legacy of white supremacy. The power of history has forced its way into the present. COVID has come, open up the roof, and now we can look inside and we can see how incomplete this struggle is. But what is holding back the great nation is not a shortage of money or capital. What is holding back Jamaica's transformation is an inadequate social capital base. 
an inadequate educational system that has not empowered from the grassroots up the tremendous energy and creativity of the Jamaican people seeking equitable liberation so that every citizen can count and impact a democracy of the educational system to empower the nation for it. It is not a shortage of capital. It is a shortage of the capacity to liberate all of the Jamaican citizens to put their energy in an organized and focused framework so we can see the specific benefits of that engagement. We all know that to be true. This is not a conversation about party politics. It's a conversation about citizenship. It's a conversation about nation building. And it's a shame to see such a pedigree nation. And believe me, with that history of Jamaica, with that history, Jamaica is a pedigree nation in the journey to justice, but it is being held back. And what is holding it back, what is holding it back from running that Usain Bolt race, what is holding back Jamaica from running that Usain Bolt race is that the educational system needs to be decolonized. And I'm speaking about building more capacity, focusing the curriculum around the culture and the history and the civilization talking about the consciousness of each generation, building their confidence for global competitiveness. These are the discourses that we in Jamaica must now enter in phase two of nation building. First 50 years, we put the framework in place and we have been able to create a functional democracy out of the chaos of colonization out of that chaos of colonization on our own with no reparatory support, we have been able to craft the framework of popular democratic participation. This is a phenomenal achievement of the people of Jamaica. We now have to take that now into phase two, a new social contract, a new social contract within which the decolonization of the educational system. And all of us are ready for this. We hear from time to time that the primary schools are inadequate. There's no support at the civic society, private sector level, government is stretched. But if the plumbing is broken in the basement, if the plumbing is broken in the basement, early childhood education, primary education, then all of us have to roll up our sleeves and go down in that basement and fix it. Because from that basement that is broken, everything else will crumble. So we go down there, we fix that, all of us, get our hands involved, shoulder to the wheel, fix it, fix the secondary, let it all, let the effervescent, let it rise to the tertiary so that we can then move on with the research and all of the strategic visions. Let us fix the basement and come all the way up but we must do it together. It's not either or, it's together. And I'm so pleased that Professor Orlando Patterson have been invited in as a kind of commissioner, a kind of czar to look at the whole thing and see what needs to be done. So finally, what are we asking for is a summit. CARICOM Reparations Commission has asked for a global summit to discuss and negotiate the reparations development plan for the Caribbean. We are asking for that summit. And much the same way that we went to London in 62 and 66 and went to Lancaster House to discuss and negotiate the independence. This is phase two of the independence. This is phase two, where the things that Sir Alexander and, um, and Dr. Williams asked for in 62, we are going to put them back on the agenda. Put, they were able to tell us to go away in 62 and 66 because we were weak. We were still a colony, but now we are independent. We have confidence and we are saying those conversations was not, were not closed. They were adjourned. And we are asking for a summit to begin phase two of that conversation where the meeting had been adjourned. We're also asking for the United Nations to take respect for that 
We're very pleased that the European Union Parliament has voted that reparations must be paid. We're happy that the European Union Parliament has voted that majority. We are happy that the Democratic Party has said they're going to put this through the Congress if they win the next election. We are happy for the global support. But first of all, phase one, that summit with the British government, phase two, the United Nations to adjudicate on this matter. In much the same way that in 1964, the United Nations met and said, colonies are not a part of the modern world. All imperial nations must decolonize. All imperial nations must decolonize. That was the recommendation of the UN in that 64 meeting where they discussed colonization. And they said decolonization must go. Colonies must become nations. The people must be free. We want the phase two. We want phase two of that United Nations decolonization summit. Because in that first summit in 64, Sir Ellis Clark, speaking on behalf of the government of Trinidad and Tobago spoke and said, Britain must not be allowed and Europe must not be allowed to exit colonization on the cheap. They must not be allowed to exit colonization on the cheap. They cannot do as Eric Williams said, suck the life out of the orange, throw the orange on the ground and step over it on your journey. No. That is not the, that's not the metaphor, not the metaphor. The Eric Will is a metaphor that Britain has sucked us dry like an orange and throw the peel on the ground. And now their biggest fear is they're going to slip on the peel. We need to get back to those conversations phase two. So please, I thank you. I know I might have gone over my allotted time, but that is always the indiscipline of historians. And I, I, I apologize for that. But thank you, Khalees, for enabling me to make these comments and for your generosity in listening to me. Thank you so very much. Danny, we're not hearing you. We're not hearing you at all. You're still not hearing. Are you hearing? Yes, we're hearing now. Go ahead. Okay. All right, now I was saying, um, Vice Chancellor, thank you very much for a very stimulating um, presentation, which uh, brings us to the point where we recognize that we have to do some plumbing work in, in phase two of this uh, struggle for, for emancipation, and um, that there is a need for us uh, to ensure that in that second phase, the question of education as the vehicle for emancipation um, drives us through. Also wanted to say that, uh, Sir Hilary, you have certainly uh, laid a perfect wicket. It is this, said that the cane field in the region has birthed and nurtured cricket fields in the West Indies. And certainly for us here at the university, as our captain, you have ensured that we have birthed and nurtured the reparation movement to pivot the region on a path to sustainable development. So I want to thank you once again for a very well thought out presentation, um, immaculately articulated, and certainly provides the basis for the um, presentations that we're about to go into. So I want to begin with Professor Anthony Bogues. Uh, Professor Bogues is a prolific writer with over 80 peer reviewed publications and a dozen books and study guides. Professor, Professor Bogues, this said, um, 
is from a Caribbean intellectual tradition whose work I've pioneered into what he once described as regions season never new. His presentation therefore should help us to find our fullest measure, Professor Wokes. Unmute your mic. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Danny. I would like to uh, thank Danny Roberts for inviting me to speak on this panel. This is an extraordinarily important uh, subject, not just because in the 21st century, education and various kinds of literacies are important for citizenship. Because in the 21st century, education is a fundamental platform for economic development and for the transformation of Jamaican and Caribbean societies. It should now all be clear to us that the colonial monocrop, mono, mono one product, that was the material basis for care and civilization is today not sustainable. And as important and crucial as tourism or other services are for foreign exchange and budgets, that over the long run, this is not sustainable. Here, the issue is not about whether one likes tourism or not. Rather, it is about us being in a certain kind of international zone, division of labor, of entertainment, of a zone of zone of a division of labor where we are seen only as a place to have a good time. And here, I want to say that there is a difference between culture and entertainment. Amy Césaire, the Martinican poet and statesman, talked about how culture is the exchange, the oxygen, he says, for human life on the planet. But I'm afraid that entertainment and having a good time is simply not just, cannot just be organized and thought about as culture writ large. And therefore entertainment and having a good time wrapped up in a tourism package, I would like to argue, is not a basis for sustainable Caribbean civilization. However, there is a deeper reason why I suggest that either tourism nor the monocrop economic arrangements given to us by colonialism are not sustainable economic grounds. If it is one thing that COVID should have taught us or is teaching us is how deeply fragile such a basis is for our sustainable material life. And if we did not learn this lesson or are learning it from COVID, then we might want to learn it from the frequency of hurricanes and what the current Barbadian Prime Minister Mia Motley has said or has pointed out to us as will be the long-term effects of climate change. In all of this, it would seem to me that we are in a, that we need to think about the questions of decolonization and the entire enterprise of education in a certain way. Secondly, that we also to do this, that we do this from two perspectives. So firstly, from the perspective of proprietary justice. And then secondly, from the perspective of what will be the requirements or what are the requirements better put for economic change and sustained development within the region. And here, the perspective is not about labor markets but rather we should begin from the perspective of what will our economies look like in the, over the long term. And in doing this, we need to begin to understand the ways of the world economy and try to, understand, try to talk about how it is that we fit in this world economy, not in any dependent way, but in an, independent, but but in an interdependent way. Because today in the globalized world, no country is actually fully independent, but we all have some kind of interdependency. Just think about China, for example, and its, in, and its dependency or its interdependency, which is around questions of trade for its economic growth. So that for the, from these two perspectives, education and reparatory justice and education and the economy, I want to make brief remarks. In making these remarks, 
I begin with the resolution introduced in the British House of Commons on May 14, 1833. It is a period when racial slavery in the Caribbean has not yet been abolished. And this is what the resolution says. And here I quote it, that his majesty needs to defray the expenses for stipendary magistrates, and that this was a necessary cost to keep, uh, to keep order in the region, in the Caribbean. The resolution on the West Indies, the resolution then goes on to address what it considers to be the necessity for religious education of, in quotation marks, the Negro population, and argued for specific kinds of education for the slaves and the soon to be ex-slaves. The spirit of the resolution was then realized in the colonial Negro grant. And that particular grant called for the training of teachers and the provision for what it then called at that time, sort of high schools. Now there are several critical elements of colonial education at that time. One, religious education. And this religious education was very important because the objective of the religious education was the creation of a certain kind of subject, certain kind of black colonial subject that the lace Horace Russell has felicitously called the respectable black. And this is so because one of the real problems for British colonial order after, after the ending of slavery was how to rule the ex-slaves who were now black colonial subjects how to rule them in a ways in which they could remove from their consciousness African, uh, African religious influences and other cosmolo cosmological understandings of Africa that these black slaves, ex-slaves had. The historical record shows, however, that the British colonial office did not succeed in doing this. And all the reports of the 19th century speak about a, a, an extensive development of 19th century African religious practices in Jamaica, particularly Mayanism, and how this particular form of religious practice became extremely important for forms of resistance of Black Jamaicans to the colonial, British colonial society. The second element of the colonial education system was to create what the, what the colonial office called a laboring class, in quotation marks. And this form of education was to reduce in the grants, in the Negro education grant words, and here I quote it again, a demoralized section of the society who might find it well to decide to live at a subsistent level of plot, cheap land, and to live in a warm climate in thoughtless activity. If we had time, I would parse and parse this out word for word but we don't have time to do that. I think what is important though, is to understand that part of the business of education as the colonial office understood it after slavery was this creation of the laboring class. The idea of education therefore, to only cre to create a laboring class and therefore not to educate people sufficiently and to have give them capacity remain for many years part of our education system, creating quite frankly, an apartheid-like system of so-called good schools tied to race, color, and class, and bad schools, which are again tied to race, color, and class. Such an apartheid um, hierarchical tier system was essentially set up to create first an elite, and then to also create this laboring class. The scholarship system developed in the 1950s was of an attempt to soak to democratize in some ways this kind of elitism, but it did not change nor did it, dis nor did it dismantle the system. A few scholarships, boys and girls were, when a few scholarships were given to boys and girls from the so-called laboring classes and they attended Jamaica College or St. Andrew High School for girls. In the 1970s, that system was further democratized, but I would suggest that there is still a cluster of so-called good schools 
and then what I would like to call indifferent schools, which are which the vast majority of the Jamaican children attend. Accompanying this hierarchical system is what is it that is taught in school? In the night in the in 2020, this year, Marcus Garvey ideas are not yet embedded in the school curriculum. As well, we do not what kind of pedagogical methodologies do we practice? So we practice a kind of pedagogical, pedagogical methodology, what one would call a, a kind of banking methodology of education in which the young children are just really empty vessels to be filled. So not only are we not teaching the ideas and history about ourselves, but our methodologies of instruction does not engender critical thought. And if you will permit me here to give a brief example of how, um, how if you teach uh, the history of, of what I like to call of black selves, how that has an impact upon people. In the 1990, 1999 to be precise, as a lecturer at the University of the West Indies, myself and a group of graduate students from the Department of Government developed a project in a place called Craigtown which is a place in, in that, that is part of what is a larger, a larger city or a larger town that's called Jonestown. Craigtown was understood to be or was seen as to be a place in which there was tremendous violence. We in the Department of Government, myself and the graduate students who I was working with in a course on Caribbean politics was, was, was about trying to understand the violence but not understand it from the, from, from the top, but trying to understand it from the bottom. That is, what is it that people would thought about when they were doing the violence? In other words, at understanding that there was violence, but then trying to understand how did people consider this violence? That is the persons who themselves were doing the violence. So it was not a business of condoning, but trying to understand so that in fact, policy measures could be instituted. In doing this particular research, we were, both myself and the grad students were approached by people, young men, aged between the ages of 15 and 22, to do two things. One, they asked us to do literacy classes and also to do history classes. And what was interesting is that we began to do these literacy classes by engaging really a remarkable person who from the Department of, uh, of, of Language um, of, of languages in, at, at UAE, who taught, who actually spent many months in, um, to teaching these young men between 15 and 22, the basic forms of literacy. But what is also interesting is the, his, is the histories that they asked us to do. Instead of developing a history course from the top down, that is the redesigning that this is what they needed, we asked them, what is it that you would like to learn about history? And what is interesting is what they said. They said, we would like to learn about Julius Nyerere. We would like to learn about Marcus Garvey. We would like to learn about Walter Rodney. We would like to learn about Nelson Mandela. And so what we did for six to eight months was actually a regular set of classes based around these particular figures and the ideas of these figures and their relationship to black struggles everywhere. The statistics, the police statistics of that period tells the story. The actual community of Creektown was reduced significantly and importantly, domestic violence itself was dramatically reduced. And I will never forget being approached one Saturday evening by a group of women who said to me, Prof, what are you teaching the men? Because no, them not, them don't want to lick us down, them just want to reason with us when we have a disagreement. And what therefore, the, the point I want to make is that there is an ex lesson somewhere in this particular experience. And a lesson in which that, in which if you actually begin to teach people about themselves, begin to give them a different image of themselves, then there is a distinct possibility that that kind of, those kind of teachings can actually create a different pattern of behavior. So my mind, therefore, to think about reparatory justice and, and education means teaching about the black self in schools. 
It means developing a certain kind of critical methodology, a certain kind of critical pedagogy of instruction, which will release critical thought and not based upon the banking method. It means re redesigning the educational system, which is still operates through a hierarchical tiered system of class and color in Jamaica. Of course, central to this is the business of abolishing the so-called digital divide. But I would want to suggest to you that technology is only a tool by itself, that it, and that by itself, is not, it is not the answer. As any computer scientist and computer engineer well worth his or her salt will tell you, for these systems, garbage in, garbage out. So while there should be a, there should be a demand for full access to all the digital devices necessary for the 21st century life, what we need to talk about as an issue is what and, and we need to address is what is it that we put in this in these the devices. And secondly, how do we deploy the use of these, devi these devices and the various technologies in trying to think about the, quest the business of the economy? If one scans the contemporary global economy, what is it that we see? In the present uptime period of COVID, obviously, there's the economic downturn everywhere across the globe. But what to me is fascinating is to look at the actual economic, look at the figures of e-commerce companies, e-commerce companies like Alibaba from China or Amazon in the US, and how, what kind of economic growth they've had over the last couple of months. And Yuan would say to me that that is, ex that is expected. But what is also, I think, important for us to think about is to think through the ways in which, in fact, there are other companies that have actually done better than Amazon or Alibaba. And that the companies who have done better than Amazon or Alibaba on e-commerce are the, are the actual technology companies themselves. Apple posted, uh, in its recent postings, a quarterly uh, revenue of $91.8 billion. And if you then begin to check the top 20 companies in the world, then you would see that of the, that in the top 20, there are two sets of uh, companies, companies that have to do with finance and companies that have to do with technology. So therefore, if one is beginning to think about the transformation of our economies and beginning to think about it over the long term and therefore through horizons, then we have to think about how do we transform ourselves to, 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 to make, uh, take advantage of these new waves of this wave, which has begun 20, 30 years ago, but which actually will continue for many more years in the world economy. The first thing I would argue in terms of our economic development is actually something that is not strange. It's something Dr. Williams argued for long ago. And that is the capacity that we have the capacity to feed ourselves. The second thing we cannot spend, I would argue, the millions of dollars that we do spend for on foreign exchanges to actually to, to, to for the importation of certain things. Secondly, though, I would want to argue that there is a need to think about the technology and to think about a certain kind of education, but a humanistic kind of education that involves the teaching of the black cells, but also involves teachings around technologies. And here I'm not talking about a technology in which we actually make the case for the software and the applications to go through and the programs to go through. Rather, I'm talking about us doing the other side of technology, thinking about that what are the kind of softwares, what are the programs, what are the applications that need to be done today that actually will bring what, what they call added value in, 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 economic, in economic terms. But to put it very simply, Facebook and the WhatsApp are not about the and are, are not hardwares. They are actual softwares. They are technological inventions which people use because the hardware already exists. And so one of the things that I would want to advocate is how do we create an education system that with both based on the black self to unleash creative, the creative minds of the Caribbean to invent. How do we uh, uh, how do we make these our our Caribbean uh, young people? How do we develop a certain kind of mindset 
in which the business of the digital is as is is and the business of the black self walk hand walk side by side and hand in hand. And all of this is important because I would want to suggest to you that there is some one of the things that I, what I, that was reading about global economy has struck me is the relationship between the things like technology, digital, and say something like medicine. So that, for example, telemedicine and the development of the of of of, of any kind of of genetic of the genetic our understandings of human bodies and so on is really about an application of digital technology. And why is it, my question has always been, why is it that we in the Caribbean with tremendous creativity do not have a set of education systems that allow us to participate in this part of the global economy? And I say this also because if I could just give one more, one more anecdote to make the point. The actual development of dub music is an extraordinary technological development. And it requires advanced technology and the understanding of the digital, particularly in the studio. When one sees the young men doing young, and increasingly young women, but young men particularly, in studios playing around with these things to produce a certain kind of sonic language, a sonic language that is extraordinarily important for, for, for music and the history of music, then my what I always have thought about is why is it not why can't we produce those kind of create that kind of creativity to produce other kind of applications of technology that will be very important to the economy and and therefore and to work and to work society in general. So therefore, in terms of trying to think in the long term, education I would want to argue is is not a national football. It needs to be understood as the foundation for sustainable life of our Caribbean civilization. In part, this is not a simple fiscal or budget problem. Sure, there is need for funds, but the question is what, we, what will we do with it? What we need to think about is how to transform the Jamaican education system, how to create access, how to create equity, how to create relevance, and how to build within that system methods of pedagogy that unleash the creativity of, our, of the Jamaica, ordinary Jamaican and Caribbean person. All of this, I would want to suggest, begins with early childhood education, begins with primary school education. That I, and, I, and here, I'm, I'm again, if I could draw from our personal experience, I spent my early childhood in Jamaica, in rural Jamaica, Point Hill, St. Catherine, to be precise, went to early childhood ed education uh, school, but with well, my grandmother took me there, but then had to come to Kingston to do what was then the 11 plus to, and to go to quote unquote, a good high school. The learning process begins from childhood. We need to pay significant attention to this so as not to create another hierarchical tier system. I want to end here. Reparative justice and education is perhaps the single most crucial dimension of any reparative justice program, because it is all about creating the future of the and sustainability of our Caribbean civilization. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, um, uh, Tony, for your presentation. Of course, you know what would resonate with me is the, the vision between religious education and the education which looks at removing black religious consciousness through religious education and the other element of the education process which creates the laboring class uh, demoralized section of our society as you put it who seem quite content with living at the margins of existence and of course you have certainly made the case that uh, the, um, the the focus has to be on creating access, relevance, pedagogy, and to begin um, where the vice chancellor said to do some plumbing work through um, early education. So thank you very much. I just want to um, remind uh, the participants, I call everybody participants, that we're actually recording this on YouTube and it will be certainly made available after um, this presentation. So <clears throat> I want to move now to our 
second uh, presenter, Dr. Shani Ropo. And Dr. Ropo is here to tilt the colonial axis, if not to replace it with a predominantly black space. And I'm sure she, she wouldn't mind me elaborating on that to say that it must be a space that reflects the sensibilities of the dispossessed majority who are black and who should no longer remain the footnote of our history. So over to you, Dr. Rupa. Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Just want to thank the organizers for inviting me to, um, to participate in this important discussion about the decolonization of the education system and to think about what are the struggles and implications for the fight for reparations. For this specific um, moment, I'm defining reparations as the effort not just to, to repair, but a transformation to create an education system that dismantles the imbalances within the society to manifest and empower the population and, and, and an equitable society. To begin my presentation, I'd like to look back to April 2018. One of the most controversial topics on, on Jamaican social media platforms concerned a history assignment set for students at Hillel Academy, one of Jamaica's prestigious quote unquote high schools. A teacher has designed an assignment that required grade nine students to choose from a list of eight tools of punishment and violence what, and to create a model of punishment create a model of the punishment method of their choosing, as well as this as a description. And the tools identified were shackles, a cockle, slave collar, cat o nine, tails whip, barracoon, thumb screw, bear trap. And within this, their description, students were to explain how the implement was used and to justify that particular choice. And more importantly, the assignment explicitly asked students to give their opinion on the following statements. On the justification, one justification for the enslavement of African people was their lack of civility. Discuss your chosen type of punishment as a demonstration of European civility. The subsequent outrage brought out a groundswell of recollections from past students that, had, that highlighted the school's long struggle with teaching histories of trauma suffered by the ancestors of the island's majority um, African population. And when I say histories of trauma, I'm also referring, I'm not only referring to the trauma of slavery, but the legacy of socioeconomic inequality, colonialism, and anti-blackness. In the subsequent apology, the school's governing board acknowledged that while the purpose of the assignment was well-intentioned, the language and structure was fraud and undermined the larger efforts to encourage students to become sensitive to what has been accepted as one of the most egregious acts towards any group of human beings in any century. On the surface, the issue with the assignment is really one of language and framing. However, this I believe around the issue of language is not a problem that's specific to Hillel. In fact, I think it's part of a larger um, absence of a, a pedagogical framework governing the teaching of the black experience in Jamaican high schools. And to be clear, I'm thinking more about how history, more specifically history of the black past is taught and conceptualized and how a language of race emerges to undermine a kind of dynamic engagement with the experience. I'm going to give three additional examples to kind of just clearly explain what it is that I'm trying to do. Student teachers are pre prepared to teach at multiple levels. When they're taught, they're taught classroom management and content. And with specific reference to history, teachers, and this is generally how history is taught across the board, at the um, high school and lower levels is that there teach, there's a, a, a narrative that is constructed. And then within that narrative, it's broken down into smaller kind of more manageable um, concepts. So, you know, if you're preparing for CSEC, it's social, economic, political, 
cultural consequences and then students develop their understanding of the past around these framings of the narrative. So what um, I found was that teachers are taught a narrative of conquest and the narrative of conquest goes something like this. Tainos arrived, Kalinagos arrived, they fought together. Europeans arrived, they enslaved. Africans arrived, they were enslaved. Indian and Chinese arrived, they're indentured. And then we all come to live together to create this Creole society. And in Jamaica, we understand it as this um, manifestation of our out of many one motto. Now, however, there is a particular problem with a historical narrative that only sees a dynamic and diverse past as one of conquest. Um, and I'll talk some more about what's wrong with that. And a second kind of example, when teaching students who are not doing history, so let's say they're doing a general Caribbean civilization course or just a general course where they're not doing history, they didn't do history at high school level, I would ask a question sometimes, why do you think Africans were enslaved as a way of gauging where the student locates themselves and how they understand history? And there are some popular responses. The one, you know, it's a kind of, very, then this is just very simply, that um, Africans were enslaved because they were resilient, or Africans were enslaved because they're strong. And these are the kind of two basic popular examples. Now there's an underlying problem with the word resilience and how it is used in relation to the Black experience. And basically resilience means the capacity to recover quickly in the face of adversity or to spring back into shape. However, when one uses resilience as the innate characteristic of blackness or Africanness or a defining moment of a black slash African experience, it's a, it helps to suggest subconsciously that inequality, inequity, and oppression are integral to black identity. And so what happens is that resilience is not seen as an outcome of res, of oppression and adversity, but rather ingrained in Black identity, right? And when we have this kind of narrative, it actually affects the gaze of the student on the content that they're being taught in the history classroom. The last um, example that I'm going to identify is a 2014 program that was done at Liberty Hall called Sankofa. And so for clarification, I was acting director for a short period of time. But my tenure at Liberty Hall began under Dr. McFarlane um, in 2015. And as part of my position as research officer at that time, it was to, I was reviewing a series of questionnaires that had been done for a Sankofa program in 2014 that was as done as part of the celebration of the centenary of um, the UNIACL. And what the and a survey of the questionnaire specifically from a set that came from St. Joseph Teachers College revealed in response to the question, when you hear the word Africa, describe what immediately comes to mind. A series of words started coming up to define just Africa and our and its relationship to us. And the things that came up were like shackles, inhumane treatment, slavery, poverty, not modernized, strength, freedom, wealth, one person out of 93 students had said that. Motherland, slave trade, black people, separation, Rasta, racism, warriors, tribes, hardship, ancestors, struggle and pain. And a lot of these words were then kind of phrased together in a kind of black people and slavery. People who are not regarded as a person who can come to anything. A strong black nation that was robbed of their freedom and their people taken to live in um, as slaves in bondage. And um, the last one, slavery and my um, ancestors. Now, the, the terms like conquest, resilience, and the words that I listed before is a vocabulary or by extension, a language of race that continues to undergird the teaching of history in the classroom. And I, I want to step in here because what I'm really talking about is not the majority of the people 
who are consumers of IRFM or Professor Vereen Shepard's Talking History, um, and or who are, have a kind of African gaze, a kind of understanding of the complexity of the continent, its history, and so on. So that's not who I'm talking about. I'm talking about the average person for whom history is just something you're doing in the classroom, right? And this is actually for a majority of the people who are um, doing history at um, high school level, right? And so it is important, this discussion is important because as to go back to what Professor Bogues was saying, is that we have to think about how do we go about teaching? What is our pedagogical approach to teaching the study of history? And in this case, history is really undergirding our understanding of Caribbean societies, their development and our place within the societies as we, are, as we proceed today. And so we have to ask ourselves, through education, what type of citizen are we creating and what is it that we'd like them to do when we enter, when they enter into society from, you know, high school, primary school, the education system as a whole. Now, in the African-American context, there are a series of theological, theoretical um, approaches to centering the Black experience or rather the minority experience within the education system. And they talk about multiculturalism. They talk about a cult, um, Dr. Donna Wright recently in the um, Liberty Hall publication, 76 King Street, spoke about a culture approach in terms as a way of having an, 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 a holistic approach to learning. You develop the human being, the um, person of African descent in a kind of holistic way. And um, why these things are, are integral to understanding education in the African-American context, what approach do we take in the Black majority context to navigating histories of trauma and also building the whole being? And one of the things that um, I think is very important is not so much the teaching of Garveyism in schools or the teaching of Rastafari as a subject in, in and of itself in school, but it's rather using these two um, homegrown approaches, which are um, as the gaze through which we do the teaching of history in the classroom. And that literally means a rethinking, a repositioning of the gaze. How do we construct the narrative? How do we frame questions that tease out the humanization of our ancestors? And um, and so, you know, the, this is something that we have to think about. Garveyism and Rastafari center the being, the, the I in their understanding of self, but they also see learning as one of lifelong that is driven, but also one that extends beyond the education silos in which we operate. Now, if we think about education in Jamaica and the, and the wider Caribbean, it's really built around a, a, a commitment to social control. Um, education, and you know, if one is to engage the literature and the, the scholarship um, the scholarship on it, and think about the Negro Education Grant of, eight, of the 1830s and the learning of the three R's, and if you think about the ways in which the persons who control resources, which are the brown, Jamaican, Caribbean, white majority, minorities, that very often their concern for education was not about book learning or the, the but really what they're referring to the development of critical consciousness but rather developing an education that is one of that's grounded on a philosophy of conformity conforming and that's where the here debates also fall in this whole idea that you conform to how the education system is so how you're supposed to function in society now if we think about it too secondary education was also class-based and we and you can see because the schools that have significant inherited wealth, which um, Professor Bogues also responds to, are schools with that are older. A lot of them come out of the ninth, turn of the early twentieth century. They have an active old boy, old girl, or past students association, and they're definitely committed to the development of their school, right? And so these schools part, give a lot of weight to extracurricular activities and give access to some opportunities that don't exist in majority of the schools in the island. And so one of the things though that has come out from a museum experience 
and I'm really thinking about in terms of museums as operating at that intersection of developing a language of race and providing a hope for a more subversive, sub subversive education experience. And subversive here, as, Paul, as Paulo Pereira re responds to it, it's really about the development of critical consciousness, but also the tools to have the gaze that allows you to unpack the ways in which inequality and inequity continues to affect the quality of life in which we live today. And so one of the issues I think for reparations in terms of learning and reparations is that because our learning takes place in silos, we get tracked into particular professions, right? And by being tracked into these professions, what you actually have happening is that you have a business of education rather than a philosophy of learning. And the philosophy of learning comes by access for non-traditional. Um, you know, the tourism focuses a lot on marketing, Jamaican cultural um, identity in particular ways. So Rastafari and lots are marketed. Um, the beach is marketed and they become closed off because they're only for the few who were catering to for entertainment. However, it is that creativeness that is integral to changing how learning and education takes place. And one of the larger problems I think we have, if we're going to think about decolonizing education, is to actually have equity at the early childhood level. It is not useful, I think, for us to be trying to fix history curriculums at CAF and CSEC level, trying to take everybody to museums, at high school level for the interventions, if at the foundation of learning that we don't have equal access to a play-based, project-based kind of early childhood education. Because if you don't provide that equal access, you are actually, forgive me, actually recreating inequality and inequity going into the primary and secondary school levels. And so there are always a, there's always a section of the society that can never catch up because at the foundation of learning, we haven't put in the equity that is needed. Marcus Garvey, um, in his approach to, in his underlying philosophy of education, believed that there is the need for transformation in the colonial Eurocentric education system to one that would imbue people of African descent with a strong sense of self. It is within this context that he states, education is a medium through which, by which people are prepared for the creation of their own particular civilization and the advancement of glory for their own, their own race. And Garvey integrated this philosophy into education programs in the Universal Negro Improvement Association African Communities, the juvenile arm. And so in the, in the um, outline for, for the guideline really for the juvenile arm, infants and children up to seven years of age were exposed to the doctrine and to African history in storybook fashion. Older children ages seven to 13 were taught also taught Negro history. And youth 16, 13 to 16 were encouraged to read cutting edge texts on African thought or on black history and critiques of contemporary society. And so for some examples we have from Superman to Man and When Africa Awakes, White Capital, Colored Labor. And in this program, youth children were given exposure to information that would empower them to have an alternate interpretation of African history and encourage to think creatively about the Black past, not only through writing stories, but through art. So this creates a safe space for children to then engage their own identities and move forward. But Prof. Historian Vereen Shepard posits that this approach allows for a liberating narrative of self, which can only be achieved through an anti-imperialist, anti-colonialist education, and allows for those affected by colonialism colonialism, slavery, and patriarchy to be anchored to a more empowering past. The struggle to create what I, I think of as an um, emancipatory, emancipatory education framework in the teaching of history is ongoing. Um, and under Dr. McFarlane, Liberty Hall's 
programming sought to intervene by providing more holistic, more positive images of the Black past. And in reference, there's a touchscreen Africa exhibit, and I'm sorry, I don't have a slide to show you, but they, they, the touchscreen exhibit allows for um, visitors to touch each Africa, each country on the continent. And it provides basic information, the name of the country, the population, like a country profile, language, resources, and all of those kinds of things. And as part of it, what we do is locate the transatlantic slave trade within a larger African historical past that locates the foundation of civilization on the continent. And so at the, during a particular tour experience, students at the grade nine level still learn that Mesopotamia um, is the center of, read, of literacy of the alphabet. Um, and this, this, is, this despite archeological findings that place the world's earliest writings in Sudan and Ethiopia, along with evidence of numeracy in Kenya, millions of years before Mesopotamia. And one student in particular struggled to accept the intervention because they had told us that their teacher didn't tell them this, they didn't, it wasn't in their textbook. And part of the problem is that there is a distance between knowledge that is created at the academic research level and the time that it takes to reach a textbook for the classroom, right? And so, one of the issues is that if even at the student teacher level we actually need to start rethinking how we construct the caribbean past and i'm not suggesting that we're going to create false facts but the caribbean past has to be located within this larger history of africanness that dates back millions of years so what we show is that there's a complexity in the african experience of which the transatlantic slave trade, which is very important to our understanding of the unequal structures that exist, that the transatlantic slave trade is one of the diverse experiences of the Black past. And what we need to do is also now find the language that teachers can use in the classroom that would then convey, convey this complexity. Now, what museums do in Jamaica is that they really provide the tools that are needed to do the interpretation. Um, when I worked with um, Institute of Jamaica at the Museum of History and Ethnography, which is now um, National Museum Jamaica, the museums are, are identified as an important resource for the learning, for students learning in school. And we had a particular issue with student teachers where they were learning to do an exhibition and they were doing work on Taina and Kalinago. And the, the teacher had broken them down into different thematic areas. They were going to look at um, religion. They were going to do a, a display on um, social issues. They were going to do a display on the economic um, aspects of the Taino society. And they came to the museum at the time and we had students popping up for all of these very specific areas, not realizing that the Taina material culture, the same object that you use for eating is also the object that you use in your religious ceremony, is also the object that is tied to um, fishing, right? And what we actually had to do at the time was to call in the teacher at the time to kind of explain why the assignment won't work. Now, what struck me about that experience and several others that I've had since then in terms of dealing with student teachers and operating in the museum context is that what students are learning in the textbook actually is extremely distant from their imagining of what these societies, what society was at the time. And, it's, and so museums actually are an important tool that is that can be used to do the kind of language of race, language, method, and pedagogical approach to teaching of history that would allow for a transformation in the education system. So if, if for me, I think that while we need to also decolonize the curriculum, decolonize the method, we also now need to be open 
to institutions that are not bound or grounded by these kinds of um, the kind of narrowness of curriculum and that these institutions like museums, like archives, like libraries, like galleries actually provide this important tool to aid in the transformation of education, to do, do the decolonization and to become a, 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 a launch pad or a methodology for, the, um, for celebrating and, um, and making people aware of the, um, the dynamics and the multidimensionality of reparations. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, um, Dr. Ropa. Um, teachers, I thought the narrative of conquest, um, I like this thing about the business of, focus on the business of education rather than the philosophy of learning and an emancipatory framework certainly needs to be done in terms of how we teach history. We'll have an opportunity to, I'm sure, have some questions um, asked by participants at uh, the stage. Thank you again, Dr. Um, Ropo. So we now move to Dr. Michael Barnett. Uh, Dr. Barnett is a member of the National Council on Reparations. Interestingly, um, Dr. Barnett in both his postgraduate and doctoral work has morphed sociology and philosophy into one. You know, seems to represent a school of, of thought that sees a fundamental problem of sociology, which relates to the organic structure and function of society. But he's in good company. Albert Einstein, Isaac Newton, known physicist, who have distinguished themselves as sociologists and philosophers. Over to you, Dr. Barnett. Okay, um, um, thanks a lot, Danny. And um, thanks for the introduction. I just am um, going to ask uh, the audience just to bear with me as I try to pull up my PowerPoint here, um, if I can find it right, there it is. And let me know, are, fo are folks seeing that now? on a share screen. Everybody seeing that? Yes, that yes, 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 we are, yes. Good. So my presentation, of course, is also focusing on decolonizing the education system, challenges for reparation. I want to start off, actually, with this slide. Sheikh Antediop, a historian, Egyptologist, also a physicist. And let me just tell folks out there, he inspired me in my academic career, because I am both a physicist and a sociologist slash anthropologist, because when I was at Florida International University, where I pursued my postgraduate degrees, I did postgraduate degrees in physics. Well, actually, I, I stopped at the master's level. I really, I really should have gone on and got the doctorate in physics. But nonetheless, um, you know, physics is one of the disciplines that's close to my heart and uh, sociology, did my master's in sociology and the PhD in sociology at FIU. And I believe in being multidextrous. So being trained in the natural sciences and the social sciences gives me a purview of the world. It gives me a perspective on philosophy because we approach philosophy from the hard sciences as well as from social sciences and the arts and humanities in, in, in elaborate ways. Um, the bind between the natural sciences and arts and humanities and social sciences is philosophy. That is key, that is at the heart of everything. And I want people to bear that in mind. The key thing is though, is that in this discussion of empowerment and being inspired, we want to inspire our students. We want them to be aware of the black African contribution to knowledge. And this is very important and must not be underestimated. So when I see Sheikh Antity up, a renowned black physicist, I said, I can do this. I can be a physicist. And also uh, along with Sheikh Antity up, I should just, I'm just gonna jump here to Edward Alexander Boucher, the first 
African-American black person to get a PhD in the US period. So he beats W.E. Du Bois by about 19 years. He gets his PhD degree in 1876 at Yale University. So no joke university at all. Absolutely brilliant. Black physicist. Um, unfortunately, he never really got to use his potential. He wasn't accepted on a, 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 as a professor in any of the leading universities. He taught at high schools, uh, uh, by and large. He taught at many black high schools, but he wasn't taken on as a university professor because the marginalization of black people still very much existed in the US in the 1800s. But nonetheless, the fact that we have a black man of note, um, he did his, his PhD work in refractive indexes. Uh, my expertise is actually particle physics and, and I, I'm very much into nuclear physics as well. And I think that we need to encourage our students to, to pursue um, nuclear physics, particle physics, you know, there's nothing that we cannot do. I mean, why can't we have um, uh, 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 analysis of, of some of the, the, the particles that are still discovering new particles even today? So my thing is, we broaden our horizons. We realize the achievements of other black scholars, therefore inspiring ourselves and reaching greater heights. We have to include ourselves as African people in the narrative. Now, this is important. The important work that Sheik Anta Diop did as an Egyptologist was he took a very close look at ancient Egypt. And he said, hold on a minute, let's reinvestigate, let's interrogate the narrative of ancient Egypt. And this is important. When we look at the first dynasty of ancient Egypt, I want you to look at this image of Pharaoh Nama. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm seeing a black man there, all right? And I'm going to put it to the folks out there that the first few dynasties of pharaohs were black and that the people of ancient Egypt were black people, people that, you know, looked African, not like Middle Eastern or so forth. So the race mixing never really started. Um, you know, folks came down from the Middle East um, into North Africa, but that didn't start until later on, until we approach you know, a couple of centuries, a few centuries before so the supposed birth, birth of, of Jesus Christ. So what I'm saying is, is that the pyramids that you will see in Egypt today, all of the architectural wonders that we see, the splendor, these were built by black people, African people. And this is what Sheikh Antidiop was arguing. So we must include ourselves in the narrative of history. You know, history right now is tilted with a Eurocentric tilt. It is biased towards Europeans. So Europeans, obviously, they um, basically they document their achievements. They document um, their discoveries. It is time that we as African people document our discoveries and document our contribution to civilization. Let's have a look very quickly on the topic of ancient Egypt of Imhotep. Imhotep was a famous um, um, doctor. He was a physician, arguably the father of medicine. He was a black man. He's part of the ancient Egyptian um, framework. And so we must look at medicine as not coming from Europe, but, but, but really coming from Egypt. Now, very importantly, just uh, going back to Shia Kantatiyah, he did extensive research and he found writings of Herodotus, who is a Greek historian, largely considered to be the father of history so far as um, Greek history is concerned. And we must realize that the current popular paradigm is that our knowledge systems, our disciplines are based on Greek philosophy. Greek philosophy. But what Herodotus said, and this is very interesting, he said that knowledge as we know it, knowledge as we know it, was actually borrowed, borrowed from Egypt. So Herodotus, a Greek historian now, admitted that Greece borrowed its knowledge, 
all the elements of civilization, he said, from Egypt, even the cult of gods. So this is an important statement because if we look at the works of Plato, Socrates, and Aristotle, who are championed as the founders of philosophy, this can be contested because if they got their knowledge from Egypt, then actually the founders of philosophy came from Egypt, not from Greece. So Egypt predates Greek civilization. Very important. So we have to change the narrative. We have to look at a different look at history. We must not be afraid of involving ourselves in that historical timeline. What else did Shia Kanta Diop say? Well, he was unapologetic about Egypt being a black African civilization. And he argues that the history of black Africa will remain suspended in the air and cannot be written correctly until African historians dare to connect it with the history of Egypt. Dare to connect it, the black Africa must be connected with the history of Egypt. That is the challenge for our historians out there. In his book, Shia Kanta Diop presents a preponderance of evidence. The preponderance of evidence to support his fundamental premise that the Egyptian civilization was a black civilization. He even notes that an Egyptologist by the name of Champollion, who visited Egypt in the 1800s, right? And this was a non-black Egyptologist, that he noted Champollion now, the first tribes that inhabited Egypt came from Abyssinia, that is Ethiopia. And that, in fact, the ancient Egyptians belonged to a race quite similar to the present inhabitants of Nubia, otherwise known as Sudan. So that's very revealing. So therefore, Egypt, remember, is in Africa. It's on the continent of Africa. It's a part of Africa. It's not in the Middle East. Let's not get confused now, guys. It's not in the Middle East. So the key argument here is that Egypt, which is part of Africa, was formerly a black civilization. And therefore, we've contributed a lot to civilization. Egypt aside, we can also look at Timbuktu University. Timbuktu University, part of Mali. This university predates many, all of the European universities of today, all of the European universities in the West. Timbuktu, read up on Timbuktu in Mali, the Great Wall of Zimbabwe. In Zimbabwe, there's the, the remains of a wall that was built that shows the architectural brilliance of black Africans. So I'm saying all of this is that we must be very discerning when we look at the way in which African people are considered in our historical timelines, the way we are written out of history to support white supremacy. Because if it is actually accepted, if the contributions of black Asian Egyptians are taken on board, it will dismantle and disrupt white supremacy because then you say, well, African people actually have their own philosophy, their own basis of knowledge and contributed to civilization as much as Europeans, if not more. So it, this, 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 this narrative disrupts the current, the current framework of white supremacy. And this is one thing that we have to be aware of. White supremacy came about this ideology to justify slavery, to justify the enslavement of our ancestors on the basis that we were not civilized prior to the coming of the European to the continent of Africa. That is a lie. I put it out to you folks, that is a lie. We were very much civilized prior to the coming of Europeans to the continent of Africa. And in fact, we were not done a favor by being enslaved and colonized, as some people would like to believe. Because the argument, the popular argument is, is that black people, African people, were done a favor when they were enslaved because we were then civilized, brought out of the dark continent, which was bereft of civilization and development, and we thus were done a favor because if we were not taken out of Africa, we wouldn't be civilized and we wouldn't have access to knowledge and resources. This is really uh, a lie, basically. So I am saying that in our educational system, we must seek to challenge this. Now, going on from that, um, 
let's look at W.E.B. Du Bois, one of my favorite scholars, he's a sociologist, the first black American to get a PhD from Harvard University. But he got his PhD in 1895, 19 years after Edward Boucher, the black physicist who got his PhD in 1876. Well, a great achievement by W.E.B. Du Bois, a giant in sociology by any means. But if you read the average sociological theory textbook, you'll be lucky to see a footnote on W.E.B. Du Bois. But let me tell you his contributions to the field of sociology. One, he founded the sociology of race in terms of critical race theory. You could say this was W.E. Du Bois. His work was centered on the sociology of race. Two, urban sociology. I would argue he was a pioneer in terms of urban sociology. He did some work for his book, The Philadelphia Negro, which was published in 1899. And for this, he did extensive research in Philadelphia. This was urban sociology in its earliest form. Then we have rural sociology. He did his extensive work and, and research on black people in the South, in the deep South, living under rural conditions. Extensively, extensive work, research, and therefore pioneering rural sociology, also the sociology of religion. He did a lot of work on the black church, predates a lot of work by any other social philosopher or social scientist. And in terms of the so-called founding fathers of sociology, the popular narrative is that it's Karl Marx, Max Weber, and Emile Durkheim. Well, my thing is, let's add W.E.B. Du Bois to that list of founding fathers, because he was right there with Max Weber. In fact, he did a lot of research with Max Weber, partnered with Max Weber. Um, and uh, he was a contemporary. He was pretty much, he was, he was uh, four years younger than Max Weber. So they were researching and doing sociology at the same time. When Emil Durkheim publishes his works in the late, uh, the 1890s, W. Du Bois is doing the Philadelphia Negro. And based on firsthand empirical research, by the way, in, in conducting his research on a Philadelphia Negro to, know, to, to note to America that black people, black people were in the conditions they were, not because of biology, but because of the social conditions, the harsh social conditions they faced because of racial discrimination. He was able to show systematically how blacks were marginalized and deprived of basic social, social resources, such that their living standards was significantly lower than that of white America. And he showed this in a sociological lens because the, the popular paradigm at the time was that black people were in this de deprived state because of their biology. They were inherently uh, orientated towards poverty. They just couldn't, couldn't genetically do any better. Absolute nonsense, absolute nonsense. So I want to go on and look at Vivian Thomas, a relatively unacclaimed pioneer in cardiac surgery. He was the one who developed the solution for what we call blue baby syndrome at John Hopkins University Hospital, a pioneer in cardiac, social, um, cardiac sur surgeon. Uh, um, he wasn't a formal medical doctor, but he helped out with all of the key um, cardiac um, and heart surgeries at John Hopkins University Hospital. So you can go and, and Google him and look at him. Now, we've looked at several male um, uh, giants in terms of their fields. Let's look at some notable women who have trailed a path of excellence. Now, Madam C.J. Walker. Now, she was an entrepreneur that, interestingly enough, uh, is heralded as the first black female millionaire millionaire in America. Um, she basically um, really came to uh, worldwide attention by selling hair products. By and large, admittedly, hair products for straightening hair, because uh, at the time, it shouldn't come as no surprise to you, in the late 1800s, going into the early part of the 20th century, early 1900s, there was uh, a push for black women to straighten their hair. And then we can fast forward to the present and we can say, well, how much has changed? Well, we've had a natural hair movement recently, and we know in the 60s, the Afro became popular for a while 
until it disappeared in the 80s with the Jerry Curl perm and, and, and perming. And now we've had a resurgence of the natural hair movement. I don't know how long it's going to be around, but we've seen recently in Jamaica with the fight against dreadlocks and and, and Nubian knots and African hairstyles that there's still this contestation of wearing black hair naturally. We still haven't come to terms with our hair in its natural state. So the discussion still continues. Now, having said that though, we mustn't take away that Madam CJ Walker was an activist and this is important. So despite the fact that she sold hair straightening products, very importantly, she was an activist and about black empowerment. So she actually donated considerable amounts of money to Marcus Garvey because she was around at the time. She died prematurely, by the way, at the age of 51, eh, May 25th, 1919. But before that, she contributed money to Garvey for the Negro World newspaper to help him in Harlem. And she, with Garvey and people like A. Philip Randolph, they formed a consortium. She founded an organization called the ID, uh, sorry, the, the, the International League for Darker Peoples. The International League for Darker Peoples, that's the ILDP. And this International League for Darker Peoples, in her conception, was a league to unite Black people with East Indians. So her thing is, if you are of a darker hue, um, you had a common cause, and that was fighting the oppression, uh, 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 white oppression. But needless to say, she founded the organization in early January, but prematurely died May 25th, 1919. And unfortunately, that organization never really took root. But we must salute her for being there, helping Marcus Garvey with money. Wasn't, you know, she put her money where her mouth is, notably. She wasn't just full of talk. She put her money where her mouth was. So, you know, she was a millionaire, but she was a philanthropist as well. And I would like a lot of African people to think about those who are wealthy and millionaires. Where are you putting your money? Is that money helping African people? Can you invest in something that can help African people? You know, give back to the community. This is what she is about. And, and that's a very, very, very commendable. Now, I want to look at Criola Catherine Johnson, a NASA mathematician. Criola Catherine Johnson, a remarkable, brilliant mathematician. And there's really is a group of three mathematicians, black female mathematicians, that were we're very much part of the space program at NASA in the US. And I don't know if people have seen the film Hidden Figures. Hidden Figures came out in 2016. And it, it really brought these women to the surface. So we have Criola Catherine Johnson. Uh, her, uh, her colleague was Dor Dorothy Vaughan, who also worked at NASA. Um, and not to leave out, Mary Jackson, mathematics and engineer. These women were brilliant. They were what we call human computers. So remember, we're talking about the early 60s here. NASA only comes into being in 1958. The first space, um, the first space uh, uh, launch was in 1961. Now, very importantly, Neil Armstrong, who lands on the moon in 1969, I'm going to put it to you, that wouldn't have happened without the help of Mary Jackson, Criola Catherine Johnson and Dorothy Vaughan because they calculated the precise trajectories that the launch of the, 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 um, the, 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 the rocket or the, 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 the spacecraft needed to make both to get to the moon and to come back and return to Earth. These calculations must be very precise. As a physicist myself, I can tell you that it is no small short walk in the park. It, 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 it's a lot of, 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 of really intricate calculations and you really have to be a mathematical genius to um, be able to work out all of these. They remember they did it with pencil and hand. There were no um, portable calculators or anything that could do all of the workings. The minds 
were that well developed that they could do all of these um, mathematical computations in their mind. They were literally human computers. Also, I'd like to highlight Elaine Brown, who's not well lauded, but she was an activist and very important, the former chairperson of the Black Panther Party. So the Black Panther Party changed leadership ever since its inception. I'm talking about the Black Panther Party of Self-Defense that was founded by uh, Bobby Seale and Q.E.P. Newton in 1966. In October 1966, in Oakland, California, is founded by Q.E.P. Newton and Bobby Seale. But, you know, they are seen as a, a threat to the national security of America. J. Edgar Hoover decides to take them on and he developed something called COINTELPRO, which is a counterintelligence program to systematically dismantle and disrupt and destroy the Black Panther Party movement. So when they came on the scene in the late 60s, J. Edgar Hoover said, uh-oh, got to get rid of them. And he, unfortunately, has the, the legacy of dismantling um, many of the Black Power movements. He started, he cut his teeth with Marcus Garvey. He saw Marcus Garvey as a threat to the national security of the U.S. And therefore, when Marcus Garvey was jailed, they, they had to get him on something. If you look on the notes, which are now public knowledge, uh, the FBI notes of J. Edgar Hoover, he said, Garvey's got to go. This man is dangerous. He's uniting the African people in the U.S. He's a threat to national security. Then he moved on to people like Malcolm X and Martin Luther King and so forth, and uh, until he cut his teeth on the Black Panther Party. But nonetheless, Elaine Brown was the chairperson for the Black Panther Party from 1974 to 1977. And, and eventually, unfortunately, the party imploded completely um, when we get to 1979, thereabouts. It is pretty much, you know, um, imploded. And unfortunately, Huey P. Newton had a lot, one of the founder, one of the founders to do with that implosion, but more about that at another time. Let's look at a couple more black personalities before we wrap up. Exam Alexander Miles. Alexander Miles was a black inventor, for African American in the 1800s, and he was important in that he developed a patent, a patent for automatically opening and closing elevator doors. That was in the late 1800s. Who else do we have? We have Elijah McCoy, and he developed several uh, lubrication devices for steam engines. So he had a patent for essentially the lubrication for steam engines, which was very important for, for a, a steam engine, a train to run smoothly. Now, very interestingly now, Lewis Howard Latimer, he was a patent draftsman for the light bulb and the telephone. So he worked with Thomas Edison um, in developing the patent for the light bulb, and he worked with Graham Bell in the invention of the phone. Now, some people even argue that he should be lauded as the original originator of the invention of the telephone. Well, that remains to be argued. But what I can say is, is that he was brilliant in himself because to be a draftsman, not just about drawing, but you need a familiarity for what's being invented. Very importantly, he improved on the light bulb that Thomas Edison um, invented because that light bulb Thomas Edison invents was used a paper filament, which meant the bulb, it didn't last for long, maybe a couple hours or whatever, and it would go. Um, Latimer, Lewis Howard Latimer developed a carbon filament, which gave you much more longevity for the light bulb. Absolutely fantastic. Then we got Marcus Garvey here, our national hero, activist and entrepreneur. We need to talk about him more in our school curriculums. We need to introduce him comprehensively to our students at primary level, secondary level, and indeed at tertiary level. Now, I, in my own way, am doing that in my African diaspora course. And I, I know, and, and I know that uh, Rupert will speak to it. He he uh, had developed a Garveyism course, which thankfully is still running in the Department of Government. And uh, I believe that, um, yes, it runs in semester two. And in fact, um, Stacey Ann Wilson is, Dr. Stacey Ann Wilson is currently, has taken on the mantle of teaching at Garveyism course. Now, 
Nanny of the Maroons, one of our national heroes, she must be commended and heralded as a female champion because I put it to you folks, she was the only Maroon leader who did not sign a treaty, that's treaty with the British, which I think was a bad move. And this is my personal opinion by the Maroons because having fought the British to a standstill, how could you sign on a treaty that demands that you return runaway slaves back to the British, that demands if there's a slave rebellion, you fight on the side of the British against your brothers and sisters? How crazy can you get? Signing that treaty, in my mind, was a mistake. Nanny saw it for what it was. She never signed on to it. And let me remind folks, the Taki Rebellion was defeated. Taki was defeated because the Maroons fought on the side of the British. It was a Maroon sharpshooter who killed Taki. Also, we have the case of Sam Sharp Rebellion. The, the Maroons were a big, big factor in the defeat of the Sam Sharp Rebellion of 1831. And then we have the Paul Bogle rebellion of 1865, 27 years after supposed emancipation, unfortunately Turnbull Bogle was captured and brought to the British by the Maroons. He was betrayed by the Maroons. So we have to revisit our history here in Jamaica. Signing that treaty was a downward spiral so far as I'm concerned, but Nanny never signed on to that. Paulie Williams, he didn't invent the helicopter but he, by and large, really improved it. And in, in, in so, that, so that it was practical, it was workable, because the helicopter really had a very disjointed history, very disjointed. You had somebody called Paul Kernu, 1907, and he developed a, a model um, helicopter, a pilot model, but this was only able to go about five or seven feet in the air, and it only stayed aloft for for about a minute. So that was a, that was a failure of sort. That was 1907. Then in uh, 1939, Igor Sikorsky invented the first successful helicopter, but its practical, practicality was still limited. So it wasn't until Paul Williams comes along who, who manages to work on the engine and the mechanisms so that we have a helicopter that was actually practical, useful, and could fly um, reasonable distances. Robert Fleming, um, he notably developed a very interesting guitar, uh, a guitar he called a euphonica. And he believed that this would produce a louder and more resonant sound than the traditional guitar that existed at the time. Uh, we also have Augustus Jackson, an ice cream maker. Um, very important. Um, now, I'm showing these lyrics here by... Um, an artist called History Man, because in actual fact, um, this is an artist contemporary existing right now who sings about black inventors, puts it to music, and it's one way of bringing the information to students. One way of bringing it to students, and I'll see very quickly if I can um, bring this up here. Um, let me see if I can bring it up. Um, oh dear, don't know what's going on here, but let's go back to trying to find the soundtrack here. Um, okay, it's not, I'm not getting much um, joy here. Let me see if I can find the music track very quickly. Apologize about this. The thing is not working. Okay, I know what I'm going to do here. I can just come here. Come here. Uh, okay, just bear with me a second. I am um, right, found it. Let's see if this will work. Okay. Yes, I 
You know, this is one of the words of analogy, archaeology, anthropology. The important in history of the musicology. I'm not a philanthropist, but what I do is a beautiful anthropist. Once I'm ready, well, we have some gifts to give away. And we have something for money to give away too. So we have to give away freedom. We have to ask some questions. And we want to ask some answers, alright? Track one. This way, you're going to step, you know. Track one. 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 Track so I think we're having a problem with it. Hello? Michael, I'm not sure if anybody is hearing it, you know. It's, it's, it's very muffled. So um, we may have to. All right, so we may have to move on. yeah. Michael, you hear me? Yeah, okay, all right. Yes, I, I think it's, it's not coming across um, audibly enough. So, and remember, we all right, all right. have a time constraint. Question time. Yeah, we're not we're not hearing right. it. Yeah. So yeah. So we can you can wrap up now then. Yeah. Thanks. Um. Oh. Okay. So um so there we have it. Basically, um everybody. Um so Danny, I, I take it over to you. Hello? Danny? Yeah, yes, yes. Uh, so yes. It's, all, it's you, yeah, handing over to you. Okay. All right, so thank you very much, um, Michael. Um, I think the, 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 the important take, take, take away from all this is the need for us to document our discoveries and our civilization and to share um, the experiences of our foreparents. Um, that is so very important. What one some of the things that jumped at me, the, the founder of philosophy, philosophy, um, actually come from Egypt. Of course, I was into Aristotle and others. Um, and uh, that certainly W. Du Bois needs to be counted among um, um, one of the great philosophers of uh, the uh, 20th century, with Max Weber and Karl Marx. And I certainly made a note of some of the persons you have spoken about, Madame Walker, Vivine Thomas, um, Chica, and Tadio, because I, I'm going to read up about them. So I want to thank you very much for that um, presentation, Dr. Moore. I want to remind the, the participants that um, you can send your questions in because at the end of uh, Professor Lewis's um, presentation, we'll be taking um, questions. So please send your questions into the chat so that we can have. So I now turn to uh, Professor Rupert Lewis. And I have to begin by acknowledging that Professor Lewis is a former lecturer of mine, a teacher, scholar, social activist, black radical thinker, perhaps one of the most unassuming demeanor 
His work on Marcus Garvey and Walter Rodney has been quite critical in helping us to better understand the reality of the peoples of African descent. And he has certainly been instrumental in giving practical expression to Pan-African ideals through his efforts to build institutions of scholarship in Africa and the diaspora. May I therefore invite Professor Lewis to make his presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Danny. Thanks for inviting me and I'd like to acknowledge the contributions of colleagues who have preceded me. Vice Chancellor Beckles has provided rich data on unjust enrichment. Unjust enrichment from slavery and colonialism has allowed Britain, Europe, and the United States to build some of the world's best endowed educational institutions. They owe us in the Caribbean. Reparation is a baseline for looking at resource reallocation for education, health, and other social indicators. However, we need, as colleagues have been saying, an education that is reconceived with respect to our journey and battles through half a millennium of European domination and resistance a perspective that recovers and validates our African ancestral knowledge and traditions as Dr. Michael Barnett just indicated, including medical knowledge. And I give just one brief example. In 1716, an enslaved African in Massachusetts renamed Onesimus informed his owner of the method of curing smallpox. That method came out of West African practices. There is therefore a long tradition of knowledge systems in Africa that need to be part of our education. At the same time, there must be access to modern scientific and technological knowledge. I am for science, technology, engineering, mathematics, or STEM, but it has to be co-joined with music, the arts, knowledge of self, and the affirmation of our humanity. In the words of the great Jamaican writer, Olive Senior, Black Lives Matter is something said that shouldn't need to be said, but it has to be said. Black Lives Matter. This must be said in the philosophy behind our educational text. The educational system we have sought to build in the Caribbean in the post-independence years is in stark contrast to the shameless system of exclusion of the majority from the classroom, especially after primary school and the giving of one island scholarship tenable at a university in England well into the 1950s. The late Derek Gordon, sociologist at University of West Indies in a study of access to high school education from 1936 to 1975 in Jamaica found, and I quote, the continued racial advantage of light-skinned Jamaican children throughout those years. Decolonization has been shaped, first of all, by the anti-colonial generation who work for independent nationhood and post-colonial generations, and this continues today. I draw your attention to the book which was published in 2019, Decolonizing Qualitative Approaches for and by the Caribbean, edited by Dr. Saron Stewart, formerly of the University of the West Indies. Dr. Stewart's chapter entitled, From Slave Narratives to Groundings, moving from the peripheries to the center of knowledge. She uses Walter Rodney's notion of groundings to theorize decolonial educational perspectives. And in this volume, decolonized education not only relates to history, but to issues of literacy and to issues of numeracy. COVID-19 has forced the educational system into blended methodologies, which link online with face-to-face. -face. 
15 years ago, the late Donna McFarlane developed the Marcus Garvey Multimedia Museum with touchscreen technology. For years, advocates had called for teaching of Garvey in schools, but many saw that teaching through one dimensional textbook methodology. Thousands of Jamaican children in the pre-COVID era visited the Multimedia Museum and the self-identity and contemporary Africa video streams that she and her team, including Dr. Shani Ropo, who, you, who, re who presented on this panel. Uh, she was part of the team that worked to create the Multimedia Museum. Accompanying this, that Donna, Dr. Le Donna McFarlane also developed a specialist library that brought together work on Gavi, Pan-Africanism, and Africa. This project was part of the Institute of Jamaica. In recent times, Dr. Donna Akila Wright, who has advised the Jamaican government and who was a close associate of Donna McFarlane and who is associate professor in education at Medgar Evers College, City University of New York, has written an essay entitled, Marcus Garvey, Implications for a Liberatory Educational Approach, Curriculum and Pedagogy. And this has been published in the current issue of the journal 76 King Street, published by the Friends of Liberty Hall. I point to her work because we have to develop a pedagogy based on Garvey's intellectual legacy. And because that intellectual legacy can help us to, brave, to bring new conceptual ideas and create new intellectual terrain and develop the multidisciplinary work that's being done by filmmakers working on documentaries on Garvey, on fiction writers working on comics, writers for musicals such as the excellent work being done by Michael Holgate, and experts, young experts in social media, so that the platforms for the teaching of the new philosophy for education has to be multi-platform, multi-dimensional. 52 years ago in 1968, Walter Rodney said, and this was in an article that has not been reprinted in the reprints of Walter's writing because it was published in a small periodical mimeograph, which I edited called Bongo Man. And Walter said, they brought Garvey's bones, but not his philosophy, referring to the bringing of Garvey's body back to Jamaica in 1964. I thought of Rodney's statement and how much it is still relevant today. Garvey, as you all know, is Jamaica's first national hero. The red, black, and green appears in demonstrations linked and independent of the Black Lives Matter movement in the United States, in Canada, and in Britain. The Jamaica Observer on July 29th, 2020, announced that the Jamaican government had launched a billion dollar Marcus Garvey public sector graduate scholarship program under the leadership of uh, our Minister of Finance, Ms. Dr. Clark, and that this scholarship program would, will offer 30 graduate scholarships each year for the next five years for public sector employees. Scholarships will be tenable at the University of the West Indies Mona and the University of Technology in Jamaica, Johns Hopkins University and Harvard University, United States, King's College London and Oxford University in the United Kingdom. This program is to develop expertise in the public sector and programs of study must be aligned with Jamaica's national priorities and strategic objectives. In my view, I welcome this, but it would be good to have discussions with Ghana on building public sector capacity in thinking about how developing countries in Africa and the Caribbean proceed on this course 
of capacity building. There is a track record that Jamaica has in this regard. We have done public sector cooperation in the past with Ghana during the Nkrumah years, a major economist uh, who helped Nkrumah was UWI's first vice chancellor, Sir Arthur Lewis. And there were many skilled people who went from Jamaica to Ghana to assist Nkrumah. We also, Jamaica has also sent uh, professionals to Zimbabwe in support of Robert Mugabe. And Jamaican professionals have been in, Zimba in Zam Zambia, uh, members of the judiciary and others. So we're not simply talking about a continuation of that kind of a program, but sitting down with our counterparts in Ghana or in South Africa or any other of the 54 countries to think about development and capacity building. The University of the West Indies has significant training capacities in all disciplines, including petroleum engineering. And there are Trinidadians who are working in Mozambique and in Angola at the moment. But we need to have a broader view of how our capacity can be linked to Africa-Caribbean cooperation. I therefore support Minister Clark's initiative, but we need to go further in understanding Gavi's philosophy and its relevance to us once his name is deployed with particular projects. Education, as my colleagues have been pointing out, is dependent on our strategic perspectives. Does white supremacy matter to us in the Caribbean or do we ignore it? Do we think of the Caribbean diaspora whose remittances provide more funding for the region's daily life than all the grants we get from the European Union? Do we think about the fact that in Jamaica, $2.6 billion worth of remittances are what many Jamaicans live on, particularly in this COVID environment. Our diaspora therefore has to be integrally connected to how we think about ourselves and how the rights that we consider necessary for them as they participate in the region's life in all our territories. On white supremacy, however, I want to quote from an essay by Garvey, an essay written in 1923. The essay is entitled, The Negro's Place in World Reorganization. And I quote, on every side, we hear the cry of white supremacy. In America, Canada, Australia, Europe, and even South America. There is no white supremacy beyond the power and strength of the white man to hold himself against others. The supremacy of any race is not permanent. It is a thing only of the time in which the race finds itself powerful. The whole world of white men is becoming nervous as touching its own future and that of other races. With the desire of self-preservation, which naturally is the first law of nature, nature, they raise the hue and cry that the white race must be first in government and in control. What must the Negro do in the face of such a universal attitude, but to align all his forces in the direction of protecting himself from the threatened disaster of race domination and ultimate extermination. Those words are to be taken seriously and a hundred years, nearly a hundred years later, the, the scourge of white supremacy affects black people in whatever part of the world we live in. The background to this statement by Garvey was not only post-World War I realignments, following Germany's defeat, but 400 years of slavery and colonialism, or 400 years of white supremacy. 
race in Garvey's thinking was not simply a social construct as most people and academics uh, want to say, but race was a relationship of power, domination, and our struggle to move that power off our backs and take their feet off our necks. With respect to the global, the current global order, the PJ Patterson Center for Africa Caribbean advocacy has come out affirming that the 54 states of the African Union and the 15 member states of CARICOM need to develop a strategic alliance in the international system to pursue common goals. For the center to grow, it requires the knowledge and research from colleagues working on both sides of the Atlantic, in the Caribbean, in the United States, in Europe, in Africa, on economic, political, scientific, and cultural agendas. It also requires that wealthy Africans and Black people, of whom there are a growing number, develop foundations to promote this partnership in both public and private arenas. I turn to the recent elections in Ghana and Trinidad and Tobago. And these elections saw a sharp racial divide in the polls. And it is clear that UWI has a vital role to play in the study of the continuing evolution of ethno-cultural relations in the region and to provide advocacy against anti-Black racism and anti-Indian racism wherever these are manifested. The anti-colonial movement in the region in the 20th century had traditions of solidarity with India, China, Ireland that were displayed in the newspapers of the Garvey movement. One of the managing editors of the Negro world in the 1920s and 30s was an Indian, H.G. Mudgal. The Black Poor Movement in Trinidad and Tobago in the 1970s made every effort to reach out to the Indian community, particularly during the demonstrations in 1970. Walter Rodney's Working People's Alliance brought together young Indians and Africans in Ghana to defy the racialized politics of Forbes Burnham and Chedi Jagan. There is therefore a post-colonial tradition to draw on. Moreover, the work of UWI scholars such as Selwyn Ryan, Ralph Premdas, whose classic work, The Enigma of Ethnicity, an, Al an analysis of race in the Caribbean and the world, Rhoda Redock and Pat Mohammed's intersectional work on race and gender, Mervyn Elaine's The Construction and Representation of Race and Ethnicity in the Caribbean and the World, and work being done in cultural studies on Rastafari. Imani Tafari Atta's Blood, Bullets, and Bodies, Sexual Politics Below Jamaica's Poverty Line provide a strong foundation for intersectional analysis. This body of work needs to figure more in UWI's teaching and research as new generations bring their experiences and their aspirations for the kind of societies they want to live in. In achieving our goals, reparative justice is a necessity. And I strongly support, and I know we all do, the call of Vice Chancellor Beckles for a reparation summit between Britain and the CARICOM countries. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Professor Lewis. Um, <clears throat> very clear need to reconceive education because it has to. Um, we have to develop the perspective that validates our own history and discoveries. Uh, we have to make that link between the work that we do in the Caribbean, in Jamaica and the Caribbean, and certainly across the African uh, diaspora. 
um, education, you said, depend on our uh, strategic perspective. Importantly, Walter on this quote, we brought uh, God his bones, we obviously left his brains. Um, and so again, the whole question of the, the, the pedagogical approach to our education, and you say that must be based upon Garvey's intellectual legacy. Another important comment was that race is a relationship of power and domination. And you highlighted the work of the uh, PJ Patterson Center for African Caribbean Advocacy, which is to link the 54 states of the African um, Union and the 15 CARICOM states. Uh, to begin to work collaboratively, collaboratively. And, and, if, and find an important point that you did was to, in outlining the work of many Caribbean scholars over the last 10 to 15 or so years, that you are now inviting the university to ensure that their work plays a greater role in terms of research and teaching um, for Caribbean development. So I think that, um, thank you again, Professor Lewis. I think that we have had four excellent um, presentations. Um, of course, um, the Vice Chancellor's uh, opening comments, his introduction, um, his, his, his seminal work, his keynote address provided the kind of a framework within which uh, the discussions were able to flow. Um, we have we have had over about 250 participants at, at one max, maximum time. Um, we have perhaps over 200 comments on, on chat. Um, very few questions have come in, but there's one uh, that came in that I am sure the vice chancellor would want an opportunity. Uh, to respond to, and that is to ask what active steps the, has, has the university taken to introduce these changes to its curriculum to reflect the decolonization of its academic programs? Uh, thank you, um, Danny. Well, first of all, as you have heard um, from Professor Lewis, the UWI has a uh, a responsibility, not only to research these matters, but to frame the conversation. And uh, his, his narrative is absolutely precise. I should tell you that in the 1970 uh, rebellion in Trinidad, what they call the Black Power Rebellion, one of the critical activists in that process was a young man, by the, a young Jamaican studying engineering at St. Augustine. His name was Carl Blackwood. He was the Guild of Students at the St. Augustine campus. I subsequently met him after he had been imprisoned by the government, put in the solitary. And after all of that experience he had, which was extremely damaging, he got asylum in Britain and he came to the University of Hull where I was studying and I met him. He was the most brilliant young person I had ever met in my life. We would have been around the same age in our early twenties and I had never met anyone with the acuteness of intellect. But he was doing precisely what Rupert was speaking about. His girlfriend, who he subsequently married, was an Indian girl. And he was a young black power man building that bridge, not only publicly, but personally, between the people of Africa and the people of India. And he has remained one of my intellectual heroes, which enabled me in the middle of the Guyana election impasse, when I was called upon by my colleagues in the UWI to make a statement. And the statement I made on the matter was intended to provide UWI with a framework to, to give UWI its legitimacy of its research tradition for the future. And I said, 
at the end of every discussion around electoral democracy in this region, there has to be a rendezvous of victory for the African people, for the Indian people, and for the indigenous people. Any celebration that is not a rendezvous of victory for all will perpetuate the mythology of race. Rupert was right. Race as a construct of power has no place within a modern university because it is the racism of white supremacy that was a product of the Western university. The Western university, the colonial imperial universities of Europe are responsible for the development and the consolidation of white supremacy as a system that has poisoned the world. If you consider the philosophy that spoke to white supremacy came out of the universities, the legal constructs that you could convert people into property, real estate, deny them their human identity, those concepts of law that were embedded in colonial constitutions came out of the university. The science that somehow white people had a genetic superiority to black people, that pseudoscience came out of the universities. And every discipline, the sociology, even the theology that spoke about God dividing up his people into categories and giving the white people a special place. All of that theology that structured Christianity and slavery came out of university theology schools. So the university itself is a principal culprit in the creation of this toxic white supremacy world. We in UWI, we have to fight against that. UWI as a university is opposed to that legacy of the Western University. We are in the vanguard of a creation of a different tradition, a tradition of justice, equality, and, and fairness for everyone. So yes, our research has to continue. UWI is expecting a great deal from the Patterson Center and with Rupert in its leadership and PJ uh, at the helm we know some very good work will be done. The Center for Reparations Research has done an excellent job, Professor Shepard, in promoting the dialogue of development around reparations, and all of our colleagues as well, in all the disciplines. When we put together this task force, in order to manage the COVID pandemic, I want colleagues to understand, we put together that task force of some of, our, some of our finest virologists, microbiologists, epidemiologists, and related disciplines, psychologists. We put all of that together before the first case had arrived in the Caribbean. Before the first reported case, we had assembled a mechanism, a task force to help to guide our governments, to put science in the vanguard, because we knew that when it did arrive in the Caribbean, it was going to devastate the poor people. And the poor people, the majority of those poor people are Black and Indian people who have descended from slavery and deceptive indentureship. So we were sensitive. How can we as a university protect our poor people who are still suffering the legacy of slavery, colonization, and deceptive indenture. So each time we act, we act with a view to enhance the welfare and the best interests of the majority, especially our disenfranchised, dispossessed people, majority of our poor people who are living in circumstances that we can call ghettoized. That as we approach 60, 70 years of independence, half of our citizens are still living in environments that are unacceptable to the 21st century. So yes, the university is doing all it can on multiple fronts. The research, the teaching, decolonizing the physical plant, 
the advocacy, taking care of the public health of the poor, working up on economics of economic development, a sociology of justice, a literature of intellectual respect. All of the work we do are built around repairing the harm that has been done to our people and the university is still very much in the vanguard of all of this. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, um, Vice Chancellor. Um, references uh, made by Professor Lewis to some of the books done by Caribbean scholars. Um, they are available at the UWI Press. If anybody has an interest, please um, feel free to uh, provide them the university in the press. And I'm sure um, uh, we see that part of what we also need to do is to make sure that some of the findings from these research find their way into the highways and the byways so that people can get a better understanding of the full meaning of what we need to do in order to uh, carry forward. On, you know, like I can, I can assure you then that when we established the UV Press three years ago, and made provisions in the private sector to fund it, that UV Press was going to be at the center of our communications strategy to make sure that all of the work mentioned by Rupert and yourself will be made available. UV Press provides daily, every day, there is a program called Research Room. This is a one hour research room program every day on the books that are published by UV scholars, the cutting edge research of UV scholars, all of the big projects of research across the region. You log on to UV TV daily and what you will see for the first time in Caribbean history is a constant ongoing discourse about UV scholars or regional scholars, regional research, big projects that have been worked through by graduate students, so we are bringing this world of scholarship to the people of the region. We now we have a vehicle that we can do this. We've never had a vehicle before, but now we have a vehicle that is shown across the entire Caribbean, as well as our diasporas in, in Toronto, Montreal, New York, and London. And of course, on all of the social media platforms, no matter what platform you prefer social media, UVTV is there. So we have connected the entire black and diaspora and Indian world. So Caribbean citizens, whether they are Indian or black or mixed race or, or indigenous, we are now globally connected through UVTV and all of that work is now available to everyone who wishes to have access to it. Thank you. All right, th thank you, thank you again, VC. And um, remember, we said that the certain recordings from from this uh, webinar will be made available at YouTube um, afterwards. So um, I think we I, I don't see any other questions. But as I made mentioned earlier, that we have over two hundred comments. The persons obviously have been having a lively uh, chat um, <clears throat> on our chat page. And I think that we have generated sufficient interest to take this forward. I want therefore to, uh, it's you no know, five minutes to one, I want therefore to perhaps bring this webinar to a close and to, um, first of all, on behalf of the Hugh Shearer Labor Studies Institute and the National Council of Reparations, to thank uh, Dr. Susan Longsworth for providing the official welcome, which uh, was done in a manner that created the kind of a platform upon which the vice chancellor in his keynote address could have um, launched us into a better understanding of our history and our circumstances. And to tell us that we have some plumbing work to do in order to ensure that education in the final analysis begins from the early childhood education right up to the university education. So I want to thank 
um, Professor Beckles for that. Our presenters, um, Dr. Professor Boogs had to leave us early at a meeting with this president. Uh, we want to thank Professor Boogs, Dr. Shani Rupert, Dr. Michael Barnett, and Professor Rupert Lewis for their, for their thought-provoking comments and insightful presentation. And if you look at the, the chat page, uh, the, I mean, almost all the comments have been, have recognized the great contribution made by each speaker linked one way or the other. And, and I suppose comes out of, again, what the Vice Chancellor spoke about, the need to ensure that we go in with our short sleeves roll up to really do some plumbing work in order to get the education system going. Um, I want to thank um, the team, uh, David Foster, Patrick Johnson, Richard Bass from the UWI Open Campus who provided the technical support and logistic support uh, for this. Um, Mr. Tommy Chen, who is the, uh, the, the CIO, who again provided provide guidance and support to us. And the uh, HS LSI team, um, led by Dylan Doyle, uh, Richard Wallin, Senior Davis, and the NCR team, Michael Barnett played a role in that regard. So he both provided support from technical and logistics standpoint from the NCR and Barbara Zimenez. So once again, I'm very grateful for, for the level of participation. As I said, we are close to 250 at the, at the maximum time. And I want to thank again everybody for, uh, for their involvement, for sharing their experiences, their thoughts, those who participated in the chat. And to say that UWI TV will also be rebroadcasting uh, the webinar at some later time. Thanks very much, and may I wish.